First off, I'd like to thank uh, Tentina Resources for allowing me to put this talk together. And in particular, uh, Vince Gartosi, uh, my co-author, who's out in the crowd here, can answer all the tough questions when I'm done. So with no further ado, I guess we'll get started here. My topic is uh, the Black Butte Copper Project, uh, which is located in Montana. Uh, the project's uh, about, located about 1,000 uh, kilometers southeast of Vancouver and roughly about uh, 120 kilometers east of the capital city of uh, Helena, Montana. Uh, basically, uh, what I want to talk about is this uh, copper cobalt deposit that's hosted in uh, proterozoic sediments in the belt rocks. Uh, these rocks are about 1.2 billion years in age. And one of the really neat things about these rocks is uh, there's very little metamorphism in them. And so things like uh, sedimentary structures are still very vivid in these rocks. Um, this is a, <clears throat> a deposit that consists of a series of sulfide uh, lenses that contain copper, cobalt, silver, and gold. So <clears throat> we create uh, hanging and footwall surfaces for these copper sulfide rich horizons, create wire frames, and then <clears throat> we use uh, this relative elevation method for basically uh, determining which composites will be used to estimate the blocks. And a couple of years ago I gave a paper uh, on this uh, method that I came up with, uh, I call it dynamic anisotropy. And a lot of this talk will focus on that method. So once we have the distances each block is from key horizons, uh, using existing options in the interpolation routines in MindSight, we're able to estimate block grades then. So the project right now, uh, we, th there's an updated uh, preliminary economic assessment that is nearly complete. Um, Pre-feasibility or possibly even feasibility study work will begin right after the completion of the PEA. And uh, there's been a, a permit in to get a decline driven down into the heart of the ore body and that's expected later this year. So this is just a quick little uh, plan map showing uh, the layout of the project. Uh, we've got, uh, let me see if I can break this thing. There are uh, two uh, copper rich horizons known as the Johnny Lee deposit, an upper and a lower lens. And then there's a, a middle zone located off to the east. The, uh, <coughs> decline is shown by the red line. Um, the exploration decline uh, will be driven to the north. The plant area is located uh, near the portal uh, with a tailings impoundment area over in this area. This project uh, has really been a fun one for me uh, for several reasons. Uh, first off, I was born and raised uh, just to the northeast of the deposit uh, over in this area, so I'm quite familiar with the area. And uh, secondarily, uh, a classmate of mine at the University of Montana in Missoula grew up on a ranch about 10 miles uh, west of this project. And he's always uh, had a, a keen interest in these deposits, in fact, did a lot of undergrad work and did his master's thesis uh, on this project. His name is Jerry Zieg. He's the vice president of exploration for Tintina. Um, Jerry went to work for Cominco, and they had uh, this project back in the 1980s. It went through several joint ventures with uh, Utah International and uh, BHP. And with copper prices being what they were back in the 80s, uh, the project was not very desirable from an economic standpoint. So the project laid uh, fallow, so to speak, for a number of years. Uh, it's all on private land, ranchers that Jerry knew uh, growing up there. 
So Jerry twisted off from Kaminko about five or ten years ago and went to work for Tintina and was able to put this project or the property back uh, together and then Tintina then uh, started a verification drilling program in 2010 and has subsequently had uh, a number of drill programs that have uh, been conducted in the area. Uh, just briefly, uh, this is a geologic map of uh, the area. The, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the actual project area is located right in here. Um, <coughs> this is a part of the belt basin known as the Helena Embayment, where uh, deep water sediments uh, were deposited in an east-west-like trough uh, basically to the east of what's known as the, the Belt Basin itself. I'm just going to show this stratigraphic section for the simple reason just to give you an idea of the scale of uh, the sediments. This Newland formation is roughly about 1,100 meter thick package of uh, shale in the lower two-thirds and then a carbonate sequence. Um, there are a number of uh, copper-rich and uh, pyrite-rich horizons that occur in this Newland formation, which is expanded here over on the right side. Uh, we're only dealing with the upper sulfide zone, uh, the lower sulfide zone, and the middle sulfide zone. And what's really remarkable is that, uh, how persistent the stratigraphy in these belt rocks is. And how critical it is uh, for the deposition of uh, the copper-rich horizons. So this is a, a cross-section then uh, showing the, uh, the thicker uh, upper Johnny Lee sulfide horizon and then below the uh, Volcano Valley Fault shown by that uh, dipping blue line is uh, the, the lower zone which is much richer but uh, much more limited because of structural complexity. Uh, the decline would be cutting uh, right below uh, the upper zone in this area in the, on this section. So <clears throat> these deposits uh, are what are called SEDX or sedimentary exhalative type deposits. And of course, we've all seen these uh, seafloor black smokers that are belching out rich clouds of uh, sulfide. Now, we don't think that uh, the uh, black butte deposit formed with these sorts of black smokers, but uh, probably was some sort of uh, submarine uh, uh, hot springs venting area on a, on a shale-dominated uh, in a, in a sh shale basin. And we've all seen these various uh, worm tubes and other kind of critters that flourish around these uh, submarine vents. And lo and behold, in these 1.2 billion year old rocks at Black Butte, there was primitive biota living around those seafloor vents. And so this is a shot uh, showing uh, pyrite and calcopyrite replacing some of those primitive uh, vent fauna. And <clears throat> here's a picture then showing these microbial mats, primitive uh, biota, algae-like stuff that was growing around those vents. And again, uh, that material has been replaced by sulfides. So we'll get into the modeling of this Black Butte. Um, we go through the drill hole data and pick uh, the top and bottom of uh, the horizon that needs to be modeled. Now we're using roughly a 1% copper cutoff uh, to help define those surfaces. Um, the, the, those points then are modeled so that we have a surface and then of course uh, we can generate a 3D solid. That's used to code the block model and uh, this is a, a simple uh, single ore percent type of a, a model where we uh, have both a, an ore and a waste fraction uh, stored in the model. So 
I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about this old uh, dynamic anisotropy method. So that it starts out by tightly gridding both the hanging and footwall surfaces. Um, those points then that are generated off those surfaces are treated as pseudo drill holes stored in a composite file. And they're used to basically capture the distance each block is from the surface. And a nearest neighbor uh, method is used. Uh, and by its uh, very nature, the nearest neighbor model will capture the uh, perpendicular distance then to that surface. Uh, the block grades then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are estimating using this relative elevation option which is in the 620, 624 interpolation series. So once the grade model's been put together then, uh, traditional validation methods of visual and statistical methods are used then to validate that model. So here are the steps then. Uh, you need to tightly grid that surface to generate a series of x, y, z points that lie on that surface. Uh, I load those points into a MineSight standalone file 9. I haven't uh, done the MS torquing yet, but uh, I assume it would be fairly straightforward to do that. What's, what's well, we'll go on through that here in just a second. <coughs> uh, so those points then are, are what are actually being used to capture the distance. And once the blocks then know their relative position to those horizons or surfaces, it's easy then to get those distances back tagged onto the drill holes. So now both our drill holes and our models know what relative position they have with respect to those surfaces. And then we go ahead and use uh, the interpolation method of choice, uh, whatever you want. Uh, I'm using an inverse distance estimator. So uh, your question was how do you tightly grid? Uh, when I started out with this, I would use uh, traditional grid sets, say east, west, north, south, or plan type grids, and uh, that would generate points. But <clears throat> what I found is that uh, depending upon the geometry of the surface uh, versus the grid set I was using, I could have uh, sort of unequal spacing on those points. So what I've done now is I've gone to using LGOs to generate the points on the surface. And I find that uh, this really works quite nicely and you can use a grid set then to help orient the, the LGO to get more of an equidistant type of a distribution of the points, which is I think really critical for this method to, to work. And <clears throat> so once you've generated these points then, all they are is just X, Y, Z points, and I use a simple script then to convert those uh, X, Y, Z points into an ASCII file that can, can be imported into a composite file. So things like MS Dart uh, uh, would probably work very easily, and I'm not sure about getting data into MS Torque. I'm sure it would be very simple and straightforward to do that, but. Basically, I'm just storing uh, the, the XYZ and then just a couple of uh, fields that uh, I use. I, uh, I assign a unit length of one to every one of the points. Uh, and there's a field I call dummy. I use that just to estimate a dummy grade for the sole purpose of capturing that Cartesian distance that block is from the surface. And this is just a couple of screen captures showing how those points are loaded to a file 9. Um, so again, the nearest neighbor method is uh, what's used then to capture that distance. And I estimate that dummy grade field, again, just to capture that distance. And I usually just use a, a spherical search and uh, if you have your model coded uh, by a zone code, uh, you can uh, minimize the runtime, uh, which if your zone is fairly thick and you have a lot of pseudo composites, and typically I'll have 300,000 to 400,000 points 
on each surface. Uh, the blocks in this case were five by five meters in plan view, and I'm gridding down to about a two meter grid size on that surface. And so <clears throat> this is a, a panel out of the interpolation. So I'm estimating dummy with dummy to capture, in this case, the hanging wall distance. So how does this all work? Well, here's a cross-section showing a series of model blocks with a hanging wall surface and all the points along that surface, uh, the pseudo-composites, if you will, and, and a foot wall surface with its own points. So for any block in the, in the uh, section here, uh, as shown by the red outline, what we're doing is we're grabbing the closest point uh, along the surface to that block, and that turns out to be the perpendicular distance that block is from the surface. So that distance is captured then and stored in the block model, and likewise, the foot wall distance is stored to that block. So <clears throat> this is a, a section uh, through the uh, Johnny Lee upper uh, copper zone uh, in one of the most tightly drilled area that was done for uh, resource classification and uh, sort of uh, local variability reasons. But it shows color coding uh, on the blocks. Uh, the warmer colors uh, indicate that they're closer to the hanging wall. The, the cooler colors then are along the foot wall. So with these distances captured then, uh, that information can be back tagged to the drill hole composites. Now, when I used this on projects several years ago, I would use either a hanging wall distance or a, a foot wall distance. And then I got to realizing that maybe it would be better to use a relative distance so this simple little expression here basically uh, converts that uh, coordinate, if you will, into a relative position. Zero means it's right on the foot wall. 100 means it's right on the hanging wall. And so this really works good if the uh, zone that you're modeling pinches and swells or has uh, some very complex geometry, this more relative position is better than using either a hanging or a foot wall distance. So again, once we got those distances, we back tag them to the composites, and then we can estimate using Krieging or inverse distance. Uh, I s make sure that uh, my uh, primary search distance is large enough so that I can look at multiple drill holes. And then we use this relative elevation option. And here's one of the key things too is uh, there's a parameter in uh, the interpolation routines when you use relative elevation called PAR20. And I've got a slide that's going to discuss PAR20. Uh, so when you uh, go through the interpolation parameters, there's a, a panel uh, where there's a checkbox for using relative elevation. And I use the Z coordinate as my relative component, and X and Y then are real project coordinates. Um, the underlining there shows that PAR20 search uh, parameter that the user can uh, toy with. So. <coughs> In this uh, illustration, we have a block where the, the block is 15% of the way to, uh, excuse me, this is a hanging wall distance, not relative. So it's 15 meters from the hanging wall. And after the drill hole composites have been uh, back tagged with the, the block model hanging wall distance, uh, we can see this drill hole uh, that has those hanging wall distances. So in this case, PAR20 was set to 2.5. And what that means is that composites that are eligible to estimate this block, they have to have a hanging wall distance of 15 plus or minus 2.5. So in other words, composites that would be eligible to estimate this block have to have a hanging wall distance ranging between 12.5 and 17.5. 
So here's a case where par 20 was spooled up to 5. So what that means is that eligible composites could have a, a hanging wall distance of anywhere from 10 to 20. So now suddenly we, go, we jump from having one composite in that nearby drill hole that could be used to having three composites. And so the third case here is PAR-20 was then ratcheted up to 10, meaning that we could have a composite that has a hanging wall distance anywhere from 5 to 25. So now we've got five composites in that hole that could be used. So I like to think of this as a big rheostat knob, where if I want to really have a very tight, crisp interpolation, so I'm not smoothing the grade out necessarily, I keep that number small on par 20. But if I want to fuzz up that contact, so to speak, that grade contact, then you just ratchet up par 20, and you'll get more and more composites from holes and being used in the interpolation. So <clears throat> what this really does in effect is uh, for a block, uh, and I've shown a, a dashed black outline on a block, the eligible composites then uh, are shown by the drill hole composite circles here. And so this method really allows uh, the grades to, be, to follow surfaces and it really minimizes the amount of smoothing that you typically see with uh, traditional methods. So deposits that have a, a, a strong relationship with grade and a surface, this method really does a, a nice job of minimizing that smoothing that is uh, inherent with other methods. So I guess the, the net effect is uh, in a crude sort of a way, that complex folded surface is unfolded and flattened uh, for the purpose of the grade interpolation. Now, this is not as sophisticated as uh, what's coming down the road. Uh, the Mentech is uh, putting together an unfolding routine. Uh, but, you know, from, for a poor boy like myself, this seems to do a pretty good job. So just in summary then, uh, we, we code our blocks with these sulfide uh, wire frames. Uh, in the case of Black Butte, uh, I use a two-pass ID cubed estimator. Uh, there are grades for both the ore portion of a block and the waste portion uh, so that uh, the mine planners uh, can account for uh, external dilution along the contacts. Uh, models. Uh, typically, or, or uh, not typically, they're always uh, validated using visual methods as the, the first thing. You've got to walk through your block model on section and plan, comparing block and composite grades, and if it doesn't look right, uh, it's probably not right. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, on resource classification then, uh, I've designed shapes uh, that I think we'll look at here in a second. To, um, so I've just got a couple of cross-sectional views uh, through the block model. This happens to be, again, the upper copper zone. But uh, you can see that uh, the block grades uh, are pretty tight on the drill holes. Um, and it looks more geologic than some models uh, where you tend to just homogenize the block grades. And, the mine planners love it because uh, everything looks high, wide, and handsome, but we know that in general, deposits like this do have uh, internal waste zones, uh, and if you need to uh, know where those are in advance. Just another sectional view. Uh, this is an example of a, a swath plot. Um, I wrote my swath plotter years ago, and I still tend to use it. Uh, I'll get ramped up uh, one of these decades on MSDA and, and start using that. But uh, So <clears throat> this is a plan view then uh, showing the outline uh, in uh, magenta of uh, the Johnny Lee upper copper zone horizon uh, with the, uh, the drill hole shown in either red for mineralized, uh, well in excess of uh, 
1% uh, copper. And then uh, there are a smattering of uh, unmineralized holes. Uh, so what I did is I just digitized shapes around those uh, areas. Uh, everything inside of the magenta line is considered to be indicated resource. And then I cookie cuttered out uh, the inferred pods. Um, I'm going to close out with uh, uh, a topic here that uh, um, Vince was asking me. Uh, he, he wanted to be able to see grade and thickness type contour data for uh, these uh, key sulfide rich horizons. So um, what I did was uh, I just wrote a little script uh, that uh, made a series of calculations for vertical stacks of blocks from the hanging wall to the foot wall contact within the zone. And for each of those vertical stacks and the average grade, uh, the thickness, and uh, the grade times thickness product are calculated and assigned as like a Z corded, if you will, for each X, Y unique block centroid for that stack. And uh, what that allows us to do, if you look at a plan view then of the five meter blocks, uh, we have the XY position in real space, and then the Z coordinate is either grade or thickness or grade times thickness. And so when we take a perspective view of those in mine site, then we can start seeing some relief. And in fact, then when it's rendered, uh, this happens to be grade times thickness. But what this represents, basically, is a snapshot of what the seafloor accumulation of uh, sulfide, copper sulfide in this case, what it really looked like. So basically, this is your hot spring, your black smoker, if you will. This is what that might have looked like. Um, right now, there's about uh, 16 million tons of uh, major and indicated resource with an average copper grade of 3.4% and a tenth of a percent cobalt. So there's about 1.2 billion tons of uh, copper resource that have been identified to date then in those three uh, horizons. And another uh, 2 million tons of about 2.8% uh, copper as inferred resource. And uh, these resources were calculated or estimated, tabulated at uh, a 1.5 and 1.6% copper cutoff grades. So I think that's the end. So.